We turn our attention now to Revelation chapter 19. I'm going to be reading verses 1 through 9. And remember, do, as I do this, this is God's holy and inerrant word. After this I heard what seemed to be the loud voice of a great multitude in heaven crying out, Hallelujah! Salvation and glory and power belong to our God, for His judgments are true and just. For He has judged the great prostitute who corrupted the earth with her immorality and has avenged on her the blood of His servants. Once more they cried out, Hallelujah! The smoke from her goes up forever and ever. And the 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshiped God who were seated on the throne saying, Amen, Hallelujah. And from the throne came a voice saying, Praise our God, all you His servants, you who fear Him, small and great. Then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude like the roar of many waters and like the sound of mighty peals of thunder crying out, Hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and exult and give him the glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. It was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure, for the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. And the angel said to me, Write this, Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, These are the true words of God. We know the grass withers and the flowers fade, but not the word of the Lord. It lasts forever and ever. Amen. We'll dismiss our kids now to Kingdom Club. You can go find Amber in the back, and she'll take you to your class, and the rest of you may be seated. And as they're leaving, if you want to take out your sermon outline and follow along this morning. According to the ESPN Sports Network, the largest crowd noise at a college football game took place at Death Valley in Clemson, South Carolina back in 2005 in a game between Clemson and the University of Miami. Having been to several games at that stadium, I can attest that it is the loudest place I've ever been to. And not even the Clemson football crowd or the Gator football crowd can compete with the heavenly chorus resounding in praise for the victory of Jesus Christ we find in verse 6. This takes place, verse 6, this takes place after the Lamb's conquest of the prostitute. We read in Revelation 19, 6 this, Then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters and like the sound of mighty peals of thunder. Now I know that the great football crowd doesn't come close to the volume of heaven's choir. Maybe I should mention the Hallelujah Choir and Chorus by Handel's Messiah. Peter Jacoby wrote of that, All the energy so far contained, all the emotions so far restrained, are released in an explosion of choral splendor. This is the very scene that John describes for us. The voices of assembled millions of holy voices in heaven singing out in joy, hallelujah. Why? Because this is the great wedding. This is the wedding of all weddings. This is the wedding for all who belong to Jesus Christ, for those whom Jesus is betrothed to. That's why we can sing songs that title this message, we're going to the chapel and we're going to get married, Right? This is the one in which I hope everyone in this room has RSVP'd for. We now enter into the last act of the play that we've been looking at for some time now. We've been looking at God's one story, His story, the great story of redemption found in Scripture. I've been saying all along, if you put this story into four acts of one play, it would go creation, fall, redemption, and restoration. The fall, what is what went wrong with the human race? Redemption, what God has done about it, and then restoration or glorification. If you're a reader of books, you know that all good books are careful to tie up all the plot lines. You do not want to get to the end of the book and left wondering what happened to so-and-so. No, you want everything to be wrapped up like they do in a 30-minute sitcom TV show. In the Bible, we do know the end of the story. We know that in Jesus Christ, we actually have a happy ending. That's what we're going to look at over the next few weeks in his story. Let me read you verse 9 of Revelation 19 again. 
And the angel said to me, Write this, Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, These, these are the wor true words of God. Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper. Have you been invited? Have you RSVP'd? I remember being in elementary school and you go to PE class and, you, and while they're picking sides for a team and you're saying, please don't pick me last, please don't pick me last, please, I want to be on a team. Or you're trying out for a sports team in high school and you have to walk to the locker room to see if your name is on that list of people who made the team. Or if you're a girl wondering if you'll ever be asked to the prom. Or for those of you who watch The Bachelor Show, those ladies wondering every single week if they're going to get the rose. Or if you're looking for a job, or if you're trying to get into the university of your choice, you want to see, get that letter or that call that says, hey, I want you to come work for my company, or you're accepted to this university. Invitations do matter. In Revelation chapter 19, we have John telling us that the groom is coming for his bride. Have you been asked by this groom to the wedding feast? This invitation matters, and this one matters for all of eternity. How blessed is the one who's received an invitation to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Are you going to this wedding? This is your wedding. You know, we often try to picture what heaven's going to be like. We envision what heaven looks like. We think of it as a place where we're going to be worship, worshiping Jesus for all eternity, and that's true. We think of it as a place of eternal rest, and that's true. This morning, I'd like you to think of heaven as a wedding because that's what awaits for us. So take out your sermon outline, and let's look at this text together. First, I want you to note this. God views our sin as adultery. God views our sin as adultery. We have this marriage supper of the Lamb. In it we find three main characters, a prostitute, a lamb, and a bride. A prostitute, a lamb, and a bride. And when you look at these three characters at this vision, you find that John and, the, and God is wrapping up the history of the world. He's wrapping up his story of redemption for us. So we start with verse 2, 2b. It says, he, was, he has judged the great prostitute who corrupted the earth with her immorality and has avenged on her the blood of his servants. Here we are in the middle of a passage on the marriage supper, and you have this verse. What is that all about? Well, you know, context is king. And if you look back in Revelation 18, you'll find that the city of Babylon is described as a great prostitute. Babylon is described as a place of great violence, of oppression, of all sorts of corruption, racism, sexual immorality, cruelty, and injustice. And all of that wicked stuff is summed up in verse 2 of our text. It's all regarded as adultery. All human sin is described here as adultery. It's actually one of the great themes of the Bible. From the very beginning of Scripture, we find that God wants to be in relationship with us. But our sin keeps us from having that relationship with Him. So we easily, so easily fall into temptation and we sin. We get tempted by the thing the world asks us to do or think. We, they, they make it look attractive to us and pleasing to us when in fact they are immoral and really destructive. God wants to be in relationship with us. He has committed Himself to us. For those who are believers, he has betrothed himself to us. When did that happen? Before the foundation of the world. If you go back to Ephesians 1, verse 4, it says that God has chosen us before the foundation of the world. God has set his eye on us. We are the apple of his eye. He determined that we would be his forever and ever. But what we see in Scripture is also this. Of course, Jesus is king, but God doesn't want us to relate to him as simply our king. The Bible says that Jesus is our shepherd, but he doesn't want to relate to us only as a shepherd. He wants to relate to us as a husband does to a wife. He wants a relationship that is that intimate. Those of us who are parents, we love our children, but my relationship with my kids is not as intimate as the one with my wife. When my children were young, I saw them naked, but they did not see me naked. It is in marriage, and only in marriage, that we're absolutely vulnerable with each other. That's why the sanctity of marriage is so important to God. That's why sexual intimacy is between only one man and one woman in marriage. When people live together, they're still not as vulnerable as they were being married. They may be vulnerable physically, but not in other ways. 
And God has the audacity to tell us in the Bible that he wants us to be his bride. That's crazy. That's absolutely nuts. It's outlandish that God wants to be the lover of our souls. He wants us to be his bride. Isaiah 62.5 says this, For as a young man marries a young woman, so shall your sons marry you. And as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall your God rejoice over you. That's amazing. I've been a pastor a long time, so I've participated in many weddings. And don't you just love the moment when all the, the, the groomsmen come out here and the pastor's out on the stage and up here and then all the bridesmen come down the aisle and then the little, two little kids come down and throw out the rose petals and then the music transitions to a different song. The mother of the bride stands up, everybody stands up and turns and looks and there's the bride. Often, everyone's looking at the bride, but often I like to look at the groom. To see his big smile, his smile is as big as the universe. Often he's crying. Do you realize that is how God feels about us? Is that crazy or what? There's no other religion out there that teaches this. To them, this is considered blasphemous, that our God would care that deeply about us, that he would love us that deeply. And you put that in better context when you see what the Bible talks about sin. God considers all sin as adultery. The whore of Babylon that represents all that is in opposition to God. You say, come on, Pastor Craig, all sin is bad as adultery to God? Well, to God, sin is extremely personal. Sin has become such a buzzword in the church. There are churches that don't want to use the word sin. It's lost its meaning. We think of it as simply breaking rules. The speed limit says on the interstate that it's 70 miles an hour, and yet everyone drives 80. What's the big deal? Sin is much more personal than that. It's not just breaking the rules. It is committing adultery. It is going in the wrong direction, the opposite direction from God. I flew up last week to North Carolina to be in part of Stephen's installation service, and I flew on that extremely expensive, extravagant airline, Allegiant Airlines. <laughs> Peggy, our secretary, got my tickets, and she happened to get me an assigned seat, which I was thankful for. But if you've ever traveled on an airline like Allegiant or Southwest, you know that they try to put, they, you have to book yourself 24 hours in advance to get in a, a higher zone so you can get on the plane quicker. So I forgot all about that idea, and so I, I checked in like eight hours before the, the plane took off, and I was in zone six. I didn't know there were six zones to get on a plane. <laughs> Guess who was the last one on the plane? Me. But I had a seat. The entire plane was full of people, including people, someone in my seat. So I showed the stewardess my boarding pass. He asked to see the boarding pass of the one who was sitting in my seat. And then he looked at mine again, and he looked at that person's again. And the stewardess smiled and looked at the other person and said, Sir, you're on the wrong plane. <laughs> <laughs> he and his wife got up. The, the man gave me a hug and said, Thank you for getting on this plane because I've got to be somewhere quickly, and I would be going in the wrong direction. <laughs> Can you imagine that still happens today? Maybe on Allegiant. That's like another story, but... That's amazing what God thinks about us and what about, what about sin, that we're going in the wrong direction. It's going in the opposite direction of God. It's unfaithfulness to our betrothed. Sin is loving anything else other than God. It is giving the love that God deserves to other things. It's placing things in your life more central uh, in your life than God is. God says, I don't want you to treat me just as a king. I don't want you to treat me just as a shepherd. I want you to treat me as, as, as a husband does a wife. I want you to love me supremely as I have loved you. That's why I love Covenant College's motto, in all things Christ preeminent. As I was studying this, I read a couple of many commentaries because I, I haven't really preached on Revelation before, and I, I heard this story, and it was in commentaries, and it was on, in sermons. It was all over the place. Imagine that you as a wife find out that your husband was spending a bunch of time at work with another woman. You would talk about life. You would talk about your aspirations, about your families and your problems. In fact, you took work trips together. And finally, you as the wife decides to confront your husband, and he looks at you and says, what is wrong with you? I'm not married to her. I'm married to you. I pay the bills. I do my duty. What is your problem? Her response will be something like this. I know that's true, but I don't have your heart. I want your heart. What kind of marriage is if I have all the other things, but I don't have title to your heart? Now, what kind of idiot husband would say that, what is wrong with you to, your, to his wife? That would be every single one of us in this room, what we do with God on a daily basis. 
Look at yourself. Look at your own life. You go to church, you've been baptized, you say that you believe, but be honest, there's probably something in your, else in your life that you're more passionate about than Jesus Christ. That's the motto of our church, by the way, that we would be developing a passion for Jesus by equipping saints and reaching the lost for Christ. What is it that we truly live for? Is it our career? Is it our family? Is it our job? Is it money? What do you really love supremely? Can we be honest for a moment? Do you know who your mistress is? Every one of us has one, two, maybe even three. You ask, how do you find out what you truly worship? Well, one way to do it is to, to see what you do when you're totally alone. William Temple is the guy that said, if you want to know who your God is, look and see what you do with your solitude. He says this, your religion is what you do with your solitude. Solitude is simply when you don't have anything else to do, when your mind is free to wander about anything, where does your mind wander to? Is it truly about God? Is it about His grace, His glory, His working in your life? Whatever that is, is your spiritual spouse. Or ask yourself this question, where do you find yourself spending your money most easily? Jesus says where your treasure is, where your money is, there's where your heart is also. Sin is deeply personal to God. If God truly wants to be married to us, if he truly wants our hearts, and then you begin to grasp that idea, you begin to see how serious sin is. That every time you sin, you're trampling on the very heart of God. It's much more than simply breaking rules. We've all seen those Hallmark TV shows or movies where a husband has left his wife for another woman, and then you see the grieving wife getting rid of all the pictures she has of her husband because every time she looks at a picture, it breaks her heart. But God, who has betrothed himself to us in eternity past, never puts the pictures away. He is omniscient. He sees us. He sees everything we say or do or think. In spite of our adulterous ways, he says this, I'm preparing you for a feast. I'm going to marry you. You're my bride. God did not choose you to be his bride because of how wonderful you are, or how good you are, or how good-looking you are. God simply chose you. The story of the Bible is this. God makes prostitutes his bride. Where's your mistress? What is it? You need to know what it is. You need to know where you spend your money or what you spend it on. You need to know what makes you the angriest, what gives you road rag, rage. That thing you have to have, when you, if you don't get it, you get mad. If you have to be in control of situations, what happens when you lose control? Those of you who struggle with anxiety, what makes you the most anxious? Our problem is much more serious than driving over a speed limit. It is personal with God. If your identity comes in anything else than Jesus, you're having an affair with whatever that is. So first note this. God views our sin as adultery. Second note this. God solves our sin problem through the Lamb. God solves our sin problem through the Lamb. That's the second character in this text. The Lamb represents what God has done to fix what is wrong with the human race. The Lamb obviously is Jesus, our groom, who has bound himself to us, a fallen, broken people. The only thing that can cure us from this fatal disease of sin, from our adulterous ways, the only thing that can help us is the blood of the Lamb, the blood of Jesus. And Jesus Christ, our bride, is going to do whatever it takes to make us ready for this marriage ceremony. Now, you probably know that wedding practices in biblical times were different from today. Back then, when one got engaged, they were betrothed. So they were technically married, even though they had not yet slept together. And once you bet were betrothed to break it off, you had to go through divorce. That's kind of what our relationship with God now is with believers. He'll do whatever it costs to get us to the wedding feast. Our text tells us what he's done. First of all, we just sang about it. He's vanquished all of his rivals. It says here in the text, the praise goes out because Jesus has judged the great harlot. He has vanquished all that keeps us from worshiping him, all of his enemies. Our God is a jealous God, and he set his affections on us, and he will not lose us. That's a reason why Josh baptized his Levi this morning, because he knows that our only hope is is that God will set his love on that child. It's not about whether we profess our, profess our love or faith in God. Any professions that we make are weak and fragile. It is his profession of love on us that matters. He is our husband, even though we are runaway brides. He has pledged himself to us, and he will bring us home. He will defeat any rivals in our lives. 
and in doing so make us more beautiful than we ever could on our own. Jesus will vanquish all of our rivals, but not only that, he provides the clothes for us. Look, I'm a father who's had a daughter that's gone through uh, getting married. For those of you who are dads and have a daughter that got him married, I, I, was, I think this is what happens. As soon as that guy gets on his knees to ask uh, your daughter to be married, the first thing that's thinking, she's thinking in her mind is, what am I going to wear at the wedding? <laughs> what is the wedding dress? That, what shall I wear? Dads, you probably know this. You shouldn't go shopping with her either. Just get ready to write a check or take out a loan or get out your credit card because it doesn't really matter. The Bible says that Jesus is going to close us for this feast with a robe of righteousness. Isaiah 61.10, I will rejoice, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall exalt in my God, for he has clothed me with garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom checks, decks himself like a priest with a beautiful headdress, and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. He's, we talked about this when we did this series in, in Romans. He is going to provide us with new clothes. Thirdly, not only is he going to vanquish our rivals, not only is he going to provide the clothes, but thirdly, he will pay the dowry. Back in those days, you had to pay a dowry for your bride. You'd either pay him in cattle or sheep or land, or you'd work it off. Remember the story of Jacob? He wanted to marry Rachel and and how Laban, his father-in-law, kind of tricked him, and so he worked for seven years, and, and, and all of a sudden he was married to Leah, and then he worked for another seven years to get Rachel, the love of his life. A price had to be paid. Just look at our text. If you have your Bible open, it's not called the marriage supper of the king. It's not called the marriage supper of the shepherd. It's called the marriage supper of the lamb. This morning, the first song we sang, we sang, The Water You Turned Into Wine, the first miracle of Jesus. Jesus and his mother were celebrating a wedding at Cana. At this celebration, they ran out of wine. A wedding feast would last for up to seven days, even two weeks. William Hendrickson summarizes how this wedding practice pertains to Christ and his church. He says this, In Christ, the bride was chosen from eternity. Throughout the entire Old Testament dispensation, the wedding was announced. Next, the Son of God assumed our flesh and blood. The betrothal took place. The price, the dowry was paid on Calvary. And now, after an interval in which in the eyes of God is but a little while, the bridegroom returns, and it has come, the wedding of the Lamb. Then we shall be with him forevermore. It will be a holy, blessed, everlasting fellowship, the full realization of all the promises of the gospel. So here's Jesus at this wedding of Cana. His mother comes to him and says, Jesus, they've run out of wine, which was a big no-no in those days. And Jesus says back to his mother, it is not yet my hour to die. Now, if you know anything about the Gospel of John, when Jesus says it's not yet my hour, he's referring to his death. So Jesus, Mary says to Jesus, hey, they've run out of wine. And Jesus says, it's not my time to die. Now, this is not in the Bible, but Mary had to be thinking, say what? <laughs> Why would Jesus say that? It's because the wedding he was at got him to think about the wedding in the future. And he was thinking about the dowry he had to pay to get his bride to the wedding feast. Jesus had to drink the cup of wrath so we wouldn't have to. Jesus was thinking, there is no joy if my blood is not shed. Jesus drank the cup of God's wrath that, that we deserve for all the adultery that we have committed, and Jesus does it anyways. The only way that you and I will ever fall into the arms of Jesus at the end of time, the only way we can get to the marriage feast is that Jesus had to go to the cross in the midst of history. He had to take the cup of justice so we can have exceeding joy. It is why the Bible is filled with prophecies like Zephaniah chapter 3. Often I read verse 17 as a benediction. It says this, Sing aloud, O daughter of Zion, shout, O Israel. Rejoice and exult with all your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. The Lord has taken away the judgments against you. He has cleared away your enemies. He's vanquished our rivals. The King of Israel, the Lord is in your midst. He sh you shall never again fear evil. On that day it shall be said to Jerusalem, Fear not, O Zion, let not your hands grow weak. The Lord your God is in your midst, a mighty one who will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love. He will exalt over you with loud singing. The only way to go from being a prostitute to a bride is to have our hearts regenerated, to be recaptured by the love of our one true spouse. 
And the only way to be in the arms of our one true spouse was for him to drink the cup of wrath in the midst of history so we could get to the wedding feast. Though you and I may run from God and run some more, the Bible says that God will not lose her, for by his blood he bought her. So note, first of all, God sees all our sin as adultery. Note that God solves our problem, our sin problem, through the Lamb. And thirdly and lastly, God promises a marriage feast for his bride. God promises a marriage feast for his bride. We don't often think of heaven as our wedding date. It's like we're betrothed to Jesus, but that day is coming. People have told me all through the years as a pastor, I wish I could see Jesus. I just want to be with Jesus. It is hard to be a Christian and be separated from Jesus, is it not? That's why I'm amazed by those of you who served in the military. I can't believe what you guys go through. You go off and you go on a, a tour of duty and you're gone for nine months or 12 months and one of the spouses stays home with the kids and you go off to duty. It is hard to be married and apart. That is what betrothal is. Even though the dowry has been paid, even though the contract is binding, essentially the husband and the wife are not together. You know what happened in the first century? The, hus- the, the groom would add on to his father's house after he got engaged. He would add on to his father's house to prepare a place for his new family and for the time when his wife would come and hopefully children would come in the future. And when the wedding day would come, he would walk from that home with the groomsmen to where his bride was living, where she and all the bridal party would proceed back to their, his father's house for the wedding. It is in that context that Jesus writes, John 14, that we often read at funerals. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to to myself, that where I am you may be also. Do you see this? When the disciples heard those words from Jesus, they immediately thought of a wedding. This was very familiar to them. As I already said previously, a Jewish wedding would often last up to a week, sometimes two weeks. There's nothing in our experience like a Jewish wedding. We come to Revelation 19 and we get a glimpse into the future. It tells us that a groom is coming. And when he comes to get us, we're going to go to the mother of all parties, the party of all parties. This party is eternal. Jesus writes in our text, how blessed are those that are invited to this party. This is the one party we cannot afford to miss. Why? Because this is the party that Jesus is preparing for us. This is the party where we get to be married to Jesus, the only spouse that will truly satisfy our deepest longings. There is no other love out there that can ultimately satisfy the longings that Jesus can the longings of our heart. That's what Adam and Eve forgot way back in the garden uh, when Satan tempted them. When I first became a believer, it was before I was married, and I'd often barter with God and say, God, I want you to come back to earth tomorrow, but could you wait till I'm experienced marriage on this earth? That really is silly kind of thinking. What could compare to the matchless love of Jesus? I was thinking there had to be something that I would miss out on. I did not want to miss out on the intimacy of marriage But what all of us really need, the one thing that meets the deepest longings of our hearts is the love that God offers us in Jesus Christ. The way marriage is portrayed in our culture, especially 20 years ago, really is a lie because marriage is portrayed as the ultimate thing in life, that somehow one fallen individual can meet the deepest longings of another fallen individual. We often find out the hard way. Unrealistic expectations that we place in our marriages are ones that can never, ever be met. If you've done that, your spouse is going to let you down. If you've done that with your kids, your kids are going to let you down. If you've done that with your parents, your parents will let you down. The only relationship that really lasts and fulfills all the longings of our hearts is the one we have our our Lord God. So let me put it this way. If we really knew what awaits us at this wedding feast, we would pray this prayer. Lord Jesus, come quickly. I so want to be married to you. That's how we'd pray. Paul says it in 1 Corinthians 2, 9, What no eye has seen, no ear heard, nor the heart of man imagined, what God has prepared for those who love him. 
He's talking about the party that awaits for us. We ought to be longing for it. What do you long for this morning? Is Jesus really your passion? If you've not turned in faith to the love of Jesus, this text not only describes your condition, but it tells you of the redeeming love that God offers your soul. Here's a great, great quote from James Montgomery Boyce. It says this, We were created for intimate fellowship with God and for freedom, but we have disgraced ourselves by unfaithfulness. First we have flirted with and then committed adultery with this sinful world and its values. The world even bid for our soul, offering sex, money, fame, power, and all the other items in which it traffics. But Jesus, the faithful bridegroom and lover, entered the marketplace to buy us back. He bid his own blood. There is no higher bid than that, and we became his. He reclothed us, not in the wretched rags of our old unrighteousness, but in his new robes of righteousness. He has said to us, you must dwell as mine. You shall not belong to another, so will I also be to you. What higher love can you think of than the redeeming love of the Lord Jesus Christ? If we respond to his call, he will take us to be with him for all of eternity. Have you RSVP'd this morning? This is great news. You know why? Because if your bank account is empty, if you're not healthy, if you're struggling with a disease, if your relationships are hurting, look at the end of the story. Someday, no matter what happens in your life on this earth, you're going to have a husband who's going to love you perfectly and for all eternity. That day is coming. Max Licato tells a story of a college girl who was extremely shy, extremely shy and unsure of herself. She didn't stand out in a crowd. She didn't wear any makeup. She didn't dress up at all. But one day, it suddenly changed. She began to speak with confidence. Her voice changed. Her dress changed. She was a different person. What made the difference? A man decided he wanted to spend his life with her. It's kind of like Rocky and Adrian in the first Rocky, right? She was a plain woman, and she couldn't even look him in the face, but Rocky sent his love on Adrian, and she changed. God in heaven has set his affections on us. And when we begin to realize how much he loves us, considering that we're all prostitutes in his eyes, and he's going to marry us anyways, that changes everything about how we live. It should give us confidence. It should give us courage. It should give us meaning in life. It affects every way we do relationships. Let me ask you, have you RSVP'd for this wedding? Because it's your wedding. To Jesus, the lover of our souls. Amen? Let me pray. Father, I do thank you for your word. I thank you for this part of the story. It is glorious. It is amazing that, God, you would love sinners like us. For those of us that do not know you in this room this morning, God, call them to yourself. Would you invite them to this feast? And would today be the day they RSVP'd for it? That they'd come to faith in you for what you've done for them. For those of us who are believers, May this impact the way we live our lives. May we, may, may we take our sin more seriously than ever before and confess it and be quick to repent of our sin and to forgive others who sinned against us as we look at your hand of grace in our lives. Thank you, Jesus, that you will never, ever let us go, that we're going to be at this feast someday and we're going to celebrate with you for all of eternity for what you've done for us. And I pray these things in your name. Amen. Let's stand as we close. Some glad morning when this life is over, I'll fly away to a home on God's celestial shore. I'll fly away. fly away, O oh glory, I'll fly away, when I die, hallelujah, by
by and by I'll fly away When the shadows of this life have grown I'll fly away Like a bird from prison bars have flown I'll fly away so much for coming. If you'd like prayer, there'll be a couple of elders up here after the service. Pray with them. Stay for the fellowship time and the Sunday school hour that follows and now receive the benediction and blessing from God. The Lord your God is in your midst, a mighty one who will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love and he will exalt over you with loud singing. And all God's people said, Amen. <laughs>